Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the A Little Less Fear podcast. I am your host for the show, Dr. Lino Martinez. Oh yeah. Welcome back, everybody, to the Little Less Fear podcast. I'd like to introduce Zoe Kors. She's a sex and intimacy coach and the author of a new book called Radical Intimacy, Cultivate the Deeply Connected Relationships You Desire and Deserve, which I would, I do desire and deserve. She is the resident sex and intimacy coach at Sexual Wellness App Coral and the host of the Radical Intimacy podcast, which I hope and can't wait to be a guest of. Welcome to the Little Less Fear podcast, Zoe. Oh, thank you, Lino. Thank you, Dr. Lino. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, there's so we've been missing each other for a couple months now. <laughs> we finally got in touch. I know. It's been a little bit. I've been in a whirlwind of book launch. So thank you for your patience with me. So tell us about your book launch. Of course, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so I have been working in this field of uh, as a sex and intimacy coach um, for about a decade, a little more than a decade. And um, one of the things that I um, have sort of been passionate about in my own life and then also really see in my clients is this craving for um, like a deeper connection with the people in their lives um, and uh, a sort of more profound experience of life. And so I've kind of over the years named that as intimacy. And um, through my own relationships and my own practice, I have a, a sort of a history of studying and practicing Tantra and also Zen Buddhism. Um, I've sort of, um, you know, explored intimacy in terms of my own being and my own relationships. Um, and then through working with clients, I sort of developed a model of intimacy, if you will. And I've called it radical intimacy. And then when the pandemic hit, I just decided this is it. I'm taking the extra time and the extra sort of energy and ability to focus. And I'm channeling it into a book. So Zoe, how do you um, how do you define intimacy? Mm. So I define three kinds of intimacy and three levels of intimacy. So the three kinds of intimacy that I define are emotional, physical, and what I call energetic. Um, and oh wow. the three levels of intimacy are self, other, and world. So okay. if you grid those out like a bingo card almost with the three kinds emotional, physical, energetic across the top yes. and self other world up the left side. Okay. You, you, you grid it all out and yeah, then yeah, you, makes end sense. Up, you end up with like nine areas of opportunity wow. to create intimacy. So That's physical intimacy with self, physical intimacy with other physical intimacy with the world. And then the same for emotional and energetic. That's very in depth, more in depth than I've ever heard before, actually. And how did, is this something that you came up yourself after seeing so many clients? Is it something that you discovered yourself? A little bit of both, right? So I'm I'm sort of my own laboratory in a way. Um, and, and of course, you know, me being just one representative in one kind of body, having grown up in one kind of culture, um, I'm just a sampling of all of humanity. But this particular way of looking at ourselves in the context of our our own being and then our our sort of immediate relationships and then global relationships and our relationship to the planet um it sort of seems like a universal framework for me so yeah i mean some of it was again like my own relationships and i tell a lot of personal stories in the book um one of the one of the things one of the reasons why i decided to be a coach and um and and i've got i'm certified and credentialed as a coach one of the reasons why i wanted to do that rather than become a licensed therapist was because i could share my own stories so um 
So I tell a lot of stories in the book of, of my own, my own sexless marriage in my 20s and uh, and a relationship with someone where I he was incredibly intimate. In fact, that was his sort of pursuit um, of intimacy is sort of how he proposed that we um, sort of run our relationship. Um, and so he was incredibly intimate um, physically and energetically but not emotionally, completely emotionally unavailable to me, largely because he was unavailable to himself. Makes sense. Um, so that enabled me to start to draw those distinctions like, wait a minute, how can this be so, how can he be so present? How can we be so intimate? And then, and then I don't really have any clue about his emotional landscape because neither does he. So what is that? What is that distinction there? Because it's not just physical. There's this other, other thing happening here. So once I was able to kind of break that out and really sit with it and, <clears throat> and, and, you know, sort of grit it out, I started to look at the way people relate to each other. And, um, and particularly in my work with couples, having that piece that, the recognition of a certain level of presence or consciousness or um, intimacy and connection that happens outside of the utility of speech and touch. Yes. And we have felt that, you know, in, in like shared experiences, right? Right. Think about, think about, you know, cooking dinner with someone where mm -hmm. you're not really getting to know somebody's life values. You don't know what they think about something. You're not necessarily touching them. You're not, it's not an emotional experience, but it's certainly a connective, intimate experience. It is. It definitely is. So that's energy. That's an energetic intimacy that's happening there. So what did you discover um, after you realized that there was that, that emotional energy that was missing with um, this is your ex, is it your current husband or your ex-husband? Oh, no. And it's actually, it was just, it was somebody that I was with for about eight months. Oh, okay. Well, with somebody that you dated. So then you yeah. real, I'm, I'm assuming that you realized that was somebody that was not compatible with you. And yes, that's did correct. You, were you able to communicate that to him at the time? Let him know that there was like a, a, an emotional. Um, um, yes. Although he, he lost interest in me as well because I, I challenged him too much, you know, like I, I would, uh, uh, just being with me, I think he could feel the incompatibility because he he didn't want to face his feelings too much, and I wasn't willing to just gloss over it. Mm -hmm. you know? So he would get angry at me. He would get he would really he would become enraged really mm -hmm. over things that he couldn't even really point to. Like he would react to something that I said or something in my tone of voice or something that. Um, offended him that he perceived to be critical or uh, or something. And when I questioned him about it or tried to sort of talk through it, he couldn't handle that. Um, I have I, I have two dogs. I don't know if you can hear that. No, no worries. No worries. No worries <laughs> at all. And so in your book, uh, Radical Intimacy, how, how could you define just the word radical um, intimacy? And how are those two words, how do they come hand in hand? Yeah, thanks. It's a good question. Um, when I started using the term radical intimacy, I, I it, it was sort of my answer to um, this common perception that intimacy is simple that intimacy is sex actually we use we conflate those terms into yeah that's why i asked you how you define right. it because uh, that's how most people define intimacy yeah and i think we we use intimacy as a euphemism you know when we want to be polite or safe for work or whatever you know we we just sort of slip that in there and yeah. go, mm. um <laughs> But intimacy, you know, I, in it, when I work with couples and dig around with, you know, what they're craving and what they're missing, and I, I will often hear one member of a couple say, I want to have more sex, and the other member says, I, I want more intimacy, right? So there is this other thing about intimacy that feels like 
a connection. It feels deep. And people will point to emotions because that's kind of what people are oriented towards. You know, I'm either feeling something or I'm touching something. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I started to really sort of blow up this idea of intimacy as something more fractal, more complex, more dimensional, I, I started to feel like it's, it's sort of like, um, it's radical, you know, it's in every aspect of our lives and we can have a deeply connected experience of ourselves and each other and the world and, and um, and that's intimacy, and that's a radical idea. You know, it's a radical mm-hmm. idea to take take the idea of like what's happening in Ukraine, or what's happening with Black people, or what's happening with trans people, or and to really feel an intimacy, feel a connection with people other than ourselves. You know, right. like a broad swath of the population. Um, but that's what I feel like we need. I, I agree with you 100% there. You know, something uh, the, as you're talking, um, some thoughts are coming to my head and, I, and I'm and i I'm thinking about the emotional intimacy, the physical intimacy and the energetic intimacy. I also thought just, just um, I wonder where spirituality would, if there's an intimacy with spirituality in, in, your, in your book. Because as you were saying that, I, I was thinking, you know what, my biggest intimacy, but the most intimate part of my life right now is, is my connection to spirit. And I feel like I meditate so often and I can't wait to meditate. Even I turn on my candles and I make things sensual. I put oils on, essential oils, and and I feel a really strong, intimate connection with spirit and myself. And do you, is there room for that in your book? Yeah, you're speaking my language. Oh, uh, excellent. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, yes. And, and I kind of, what I sort of chalk that up to is um, an energetic intimacy. You know, I think for people who, I, I wanted to write a book for people who have no interest in sitting on a meditation cushion or uh, or a yoga mat or, or whatever, but really, um, but really, slowing down, silence, being able to sit into the emptiness or the uh, mystery or whatever language you use to describe the the unknown, you know, that place of like where we stop and, and the universe begins, you know, that sort of like the oneness of all, um, That is really, and that really has informed my work all along. When I first started studying Tantra, I don't know, about 15 years ago, I I felt as though I had come home. I had come home to myself. And like the the sort of combination of, uh, I'm the former senior editor of LA Yoga Magazine. So I'm a longtime yoga practitioner. And I used to say, like, I want to have sex the way I do yoga. Like I want to feel that way at the end of a yoga class. That's how I want to feel when I'm having sex or, you know, or chanting mantras or kirtan or, um, or zazen, you know, like it's that sort of, um, sex can be a form of prayer as can any form of intimacy, you know, that sort of that deep connection beyond what we think we know. Yes, it could be very meditative as well. Having, wow, that, that's is that how you would describe for our listeners that don't know what tantra is? How could you explain and describe what tantra is? Yeah, tantra is a hard thing to. I know it is sort of summarize, <laughs> but it really is. Yes, tantra is, and most people have heard of tantra because. Back in the um, 80s or 90s, Sting did an interview and he happened to be drunk at the time and made a, a joke, an offhanded comment about having tantric sex. And so then everybody was like, tantric sex, what is that? What is that? Um, and and at the time, he had never had tantric sex, actually. I think <laughs> the words in, in the aftermath of that interview, they he and Trudy started to explore that. But Um, But Tantra is, um, there are many different sort of lineages and schools of thought with Tantra. Um, Tantra is basically a form of Hinduism. Um, Many people in in, uh, India consider Tantra to be like 
um, Hindu paganism, um, where it's it's much less formalized and not, and a little bit wild and esoteric and not necessarily sort of cleaned up. Um, and so it's really a, a, a philosophy and and a a perspective of seeing the world that incorporates everything, um, you know, shadow to light um, as divine. And that includes sexuality and it includes, it's like everything in us, there's no separation from the divine to what's happening right here. It's mm -hmm. all one. And so sex becomes literally a form of worship or devotion mm -hmm. and prayer. And, um, and so that has been taken, like you will see a lot in this country, in the United States, you'll see a lot of um, what's called neo-tantra, which takes a lot of the sexual practices, which is often sort of like a little bit like a um, high level of sensual awareness, very slow, extended periods of arousal, um, a, an exploration of masculine and feminine energies, and um, and kind of takes all of the um, mysticism out of it mm -hmm. and just uses those sexual practices as um, a sort of form of... Uh, wellness and sex practice, sexual wellness. Um, the Tantra that I studied was very esoteric, very out there and very sort of as philosophical as anything else. Um, so very deep. And so how do you incorporate that uh, Tantra with intimacy? Mm. It's a good question. And I really made a very conscious decision at one point that I was not going to, you know, there was a fork in the road. Am I going to be a Tantra teacher or am I going to um, be a, a sexologist and a yeah. sex coach and an intimacy coach um, in a much more mainstream accessible way? And I, and I chose that path. Everything that I do and everything I know about our bodies and sexuality and the potential for relationship really leans heavily into Tantra and what I learned from Tantra. Mm -hmm. When I started studying with Salma Zadora, um, I don't know if some people out there may, may have heard of her. Um, she's no longer alive, but she was a very controversial um, Tantra teacher. And, um, and, Practicing with her and studying with her really changed my life. So I take those things, that awareness that I gained from working with her and, and really set out to make that accessible to everybody. Like if I, you don't have to be chanting Sanskrit mantras to experience what I experienced, that's one way. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, that's a way that just, I sort of stumbled into, but it doesn't have to be like that. That level of um, awareness and embodiment and ease and um, self-expression can happen in in any context. Oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, tell us a little bit more about your book. I, the rest of the title of it is "Radical Intimacy: Cultivate the Deeply Connected Relationships You Deserve, Desire, Deserve and Desire." Is that correct? Desire yes. and deserve. Yes. So how does one start to begin to cultivate something deep? Is that through having sessions with you? Is that through somebody um, getting more in contact with their higher self? I mean, well, what, is that, what is that composed of? What does that look like? Um, it can look like many different things to many people. Um, I, I think the book, I really wrote the book so that people could start to get an idea of how to go about getting more connected in their lives. And really one of the big takeaways from the book, I think, is that we can only meet each other to the extent that we can meet ourselves, right? right? We yes. really, we just, if we want or, and are craving that kind of um, deep connection to be seen and held and to see and hold and hold the other people in our lives, we have to be able to know what it is that we're sharing. You know, we have to be able to, to say, um, you know, here's this piece of me. 
Here's what's happening inside of me. Um, here's what I'm struggling with. Here's what I'm celebrating. And so often in this culture, we are so busy, go, 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 and, and sort of skimming the surface of our lives, you know? And so um, first and foremost, I think the book, um, one aspect of the book is how to really connect with yourself, how to be really honest with yourself. I talk about, I talk about the trifecta of anti-intimacy. Oh, wow. Just denial, deflection, and distraction. Oh, wow. And ways in which we, we sort of deny that there's something going on. Three Ds, huh? Yeah. <laughs> There's, there's like, we did not, you know, we, we, we did not, everything's fine. Everything's fine. I'm good. I'm all right. And not just to other people, but to ourselves, you know, um, I'm a master at this. I had cancer when I was 20 and when I was at university and, um, and, you know, I, yeah, it was hard and there were definitely some emotional moments. Um, but I was a trooper and I was busy surviving and, um, and then I, and then afterwards, you know, I moved on and I kept, well, now I'm in my fifties, you know, 30 years later. And, um, and there's some fallout there from having been so tough and not having processed a lot of that trauma mm -hmm. of, of having had cancer and, and gone through treatment at 20. So, you know, that, that aspect of like, it's all good. It's all good. I'm just chugging along. We're just surviving here. Like there's an aspect of um, denial that is serving to separate us from ourselves. Yes. We also get really good at deflection. So, you know, my husband likes to say about couples, he also coaches couples. Um, and he will, he, he will often say like, it's never about the dishes. You know, like we make it about the dishes or we make it about the laundry or we make it about something, but it's really not actually. And sometimes it's, it's so true. It's right? So true. Yeah. Sometimes it's like in something in the relationship. Sometimes it has nothing to even do with the relationship, you know? Right. There are times when I know he's stressed out about something and he'll say something in the way that I sort of bristle. And I have to just say like, oh yeah, Right. Like he didn't sleep last night, you know, he's a, my husband's a terrible sleeper. And if he's tired, I have to just let things roll off my back, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, but so we, we deflect, you know, we, we like, we, we get mad about something and I tell stories and give examples of this in the book. Um, some really like crazy ones of what people get mad at, um, you know, instead of really looking at what's actually at happening which you're in denial of, right? Yeah. You're gaslighting yourself. Right. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, and then distraction. You know, we all have our version of, you know, a gallon of Ben and Jerry's on the sofa. <laughs> binge fest, you know? Yes, definitely. So, so those, are the, those are the ways, you know, those are the ways in which we, um, in, in which we sort of like put up roadblocks to intimacy. So, and that happens with ourselves first and foremost, and then with our, with our people. I can't imagine how difficult it must be to have clients who have never really experienced wow. intimacy in any of these levels in their life. Yeah. Um, where do you start then? You know, how do you start then? Yeah. You know, I think by the time people come to me, um, I think that a good number of them have actually been in therapy. Okay. Um, a good number of them have been in therapy. They've done some amount of work. So there's some awareness going on. Some awareness going on. And and then, I mean, some of them, I, I, I taught for many years at a, a yoga festival, a bhakti fest. And, and so I did a lot of coaching with people who are like on a very dedicated spiritual path. So, um, and I still... Um, believe it or not, I, that, that festival hasn't been running since about a year before the pandemic. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's several years. And I still have people coming through my door that are sort of connected in those circles. Um, 
but you know what happens with couples in particular um even if i'm coaching one member of a couple and they're coming to me for some kind of you know suffering that's going on in their sex life um they've usually been in therapy and their therapist can't really address the sexuality aspect because they're not trained to so that's when they reach out to me which is at 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 some point sort of fine tuning oh yeah um, that makes sense and there are people that I refer out to a therapist, you know? Yes. There are people, if if someone is not awake and aware enough to be able to actually take action, then they're not a good coaching candidate. Then they need, if they're really like stuck in something that is stopping them and they're unaware of what it is that's holding them back, um, that's, a, that's a job for a therapist. Oh, yes, definitely. Right. Well, this sounds like fun what you do. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> it can be heartbreaking. It can be gut wrenching. Um, it's really vulnerable work, you know. Yeah, and but the wonderful thing is that you're you're able to talk about your own personal experiences, and that always helps people open up when you do that. Yes, yes, and I I mean my sessions really are about my clients, but Dr. Lino, it's so helpful to normalize people's pain you know yes, definitely really, to really um to let them know that they're not alone you know right. and whether it's me and my story or a client's story um of of you know like overcoming this kind of hardship and this kind of pain um is really it it gives a great context to the work what's the biggest takeaway from your book what what do you want people to know? What's the biggest thing you want people to know? You can answer both questions or one or the other. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I feel like I always have a different answer for this, but but I'm going to say this here with you, and that is that we have a certain narrative of sex and sexuality and that relationship with ourselves and and that sort of. Um, part of, of human existence, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it is so off base and so screwed up. Mm -hmm. um, it's really based in um, white male patriarchy um, and, um, and, and that is rooted in sort of in an ancient religious context that mm -hmm. is not applicable to sovereignty, agency, freedom, self-expression, authenticity, identity. Um, and I just, you know, whoever you are, whatever body parts you have, whatever pronouns you have, whatever the color of your skin, no matter the shape of your body, you are, um, you are, you are allowed to feel pleasure, to express yourself, to have sex with whoever you want to have sex with, um, you know, as long as it's consensual and as long as nobody's getting hurt. Um, that's one of the great joys of life. Um, so yeah, I'm sure we choose to incarnate because <laughs> that's probably yeah. one of the reasons why we're like, I'm coming back as a human. Yeah, I mean, look, we we get to, you know, we each come from sex. That's yeah. how human beings are made. It's life affirming. Right. It's joyous. It's, you know, it's celebratory. It's divine. It's sacred. It's amazing. It's like, you know. And stress relieving. Yes. I, yes, it's physically, it's healthy for you. It's a wellness practice, you know. You brush your teeth. You self-pleasure. You, you know. It's just, it's like, and and so the idea that there's shame, that there's guilt, that we're doing something wrong or that we should do it a certain way, our miraculous bodies are an opportunity to step into a pleasure laboratory, either solo or with a partner or more than one partner, if that's what you choose, and to really experience the fullness of being alive. I love how you said that, a pleasure laboratory. That's, that's amazing. I love that. <laughs> Zoe Kors, everybody, how can our viewers, our watchers, and our listeners find you? And how can we find your book? 
Yeah. Well, so the book is Radical Intimacy and it's available wherever you buy books. It's a major publisher. So it's easy for bookstores to order it if they don't already have it on the shelf. You can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, or if you like to support independent bookstores online, bookshop.org. Um, the Radical Intimacy podcast is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. And the hub of all things Zoe is zoecores.com. Z-O-E-K-O-R-S dot com. Zoe Kors, everybody. What a pleasure. What an awesome person, human being you are. Thank you so much for being on the Little Less Fear podcast. And I'm certain we will keep in touch. Thank you for yes. all your valuable information. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's my privilege. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to a Little Less Fear podcast. For more information on my social media pages, you can visit me at www.alittlelessfear.com. I also have an incredible list of resources for people all over the world, and it's it's really formulated to help all kinds of people, LGBTQIA community, alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I mean, disabilities, I mean, the list goes on, so feel free to visit my website, alittlelessfear.com. You can also email me at alittlelessfear at gmail.com. I'm also on Patreon. I'm a life purpose counselor on Patreon for, uh, this is available for everybody and it's also available for only exclusive members on Patreon. Everybody's welcome. So please visit me there at www.patreon.com backslash a little less fear. Thank you to all the new followers and subscribers. Go ahead and hit the follow subscribe button if you haven't already and tell your friends and family about a little less fear podcast. Thanks so much for all your support. Love you all. Have a blessed day. Thank you.